Today's talk is about coastal wetlands in Georgian Bay. I'm going to be covering a few different topics. It's always hard when I consider a presentation because if you know me or have been in the field with me, I can talk for a very, very long time about a large variety of topics. So kind of channeling that into one shorter presentation can be challenging sometimes, but I think I've maybe done an okay job of that. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the different types of wetlands that we have in Georgian Bay, and then some of the species as well that utilize them, as well as the importance of them. Um, and this is uh, this coastal wetland is what we're going to learn is an open water marsh. And you can see a variety of different aquatic plants in there, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So what is a coastal wetland? And when I was putting this presentation together, I knew what I considered a coastal wetland. I knew what kind of made sense as a coastal wetland, but in in looking around, there isn't exactly a clear definition. So as a certified wetland evaluator, I tend to default to the Ontario wetland evaluation system for any questions relating to wetlands, because that's the system that we use to designate provincially significant wetlands. So it seems like the most uh, functional tool to be able to answer some of these questions. So what I decided on was a coastal wetland, or what this talk is going to be on, is a coastal wetland is an area with water tol tolerant plant species that is adjacent or near to a coast. So it doesn't necessarily need to be right on the coast. Uh, when we're talking about wetlands, often they're complex together. So they're hydrologically connected. So I'm considering some of the hydrologically connected wetlands to also be somewhat coastal wetlands. Obviously, if you get like two kilometers interior, it's probably no longer a coastal wetland. So things that are relatively near the close, coast, probably within 500 meters or um, 750 meters around there. They can be complex together. You're going to get different types of wetlands. Uh, let me know if you can't see my drawings. And I have to remember how to make it thick. Okay, so back here, you'll see what is more uh, meadow marsh. You'll see the upland forest above it. You'll see something like an emergent marsh closer here. So there's a lot of variety, a lot of different types of wetlands that can kind of be complex together. But uh, so we kind of consider all of those as what a coastal wetland would be. So they're not always what you think. If you looked at this picture, you might not necessarily immediately consider this a coastal wetland. It looks more like a meadow. Uh, and this would be something we would call a meadow marsh. So I can almost guarantee you, if you did walk through this, especially in early spring, your feet would get wet. It doesn't look like your feet would get wet, but they probably would. And that's because when we're talking about wetlands, that definition water tolerant species that's really key to what wetlands are most wetlands are designated that because of the plant species that are part of that make up that ecosystem so it's not just it doesn't necessarily remain wet all year sometimes you know we've seen marshes where they dry out depending on what the summer is looking like if we have a really hot summer sometimes those meadow marshes will dry out so something like this may not be dry wet all year, but it's going to be wet for a majority of the year, and it's going to be highlighted by a number of water tolerant species. The other neat thing about IDing wetlands, uh, and I'll highlight this, this plant because uh, not everyone may know what it is. This tree right here is silver maple, and that's a species of maple that loves being adjacent to water. It loves, it's not, it's not a wetland species necessarily, but it loves being right on the edge of wetlands. So that's a really key species to be able to look for when you're trying to figure out if things are wetlands. And the way you can tell the difference is because it has all these kind of, all the branches shoot upwards. And there's there's a more obvious example I'll show later, but they, they look like fingers pointing to the sky. And that's how you uh, determine that it's silver maple. That's really diagnostic feature of that species. So looking at the plant species is what's going to tell you whether it's a wetland or not. Going Walking through it is also probably going to give you a pretty good indication. But most of our wetlands are designated based off the plant species, not necessarily what it looks like. So what are the importance of coastal wetlands? It was, again, kind of an interesting part of the talk 
talking about the importance of coastal wetlands, it's really easy to look at this and say, well, you know, it just provides habitat for species. And, you know, if we were to suddenly lose alder flycatchers from all of our coastal wetlands, would that really impact us? Like, you know, is losing one bird species that critical to the ecosystem? Or does it really even impact us besides we don't get to see that species? And I'm going to relate this to one example from, I believe, Guam. Guam had uh, Guam has a lot of endemic species of birds because it's an island. They had the brown rat snake was introduced, I don't know, many years ago. And that was an invasive species. And it quickly eliminated or critically imperiled a number of endemic bird species, insectivores, almost all insectivores. And what happens on Guam now is on wet summers, they have 40% more spiders than any of the nearby islands because the brown rat snake wiped out a number of insectivorous birds and those birds fed on spiders. And now they see these big explosion in spider populations during the wet seasons. So yes, imp the importance of coastal wetlands is species habitat. And it may seem like nothing if a alder flycatcher or a common yellowthroat gets wiped out of wetland, but I can almost guarantee it you'll notice in other ways. So wetlands are really, really important fish spawning habitat. When we see, especially those open water marshes, we have a number of uh, fish that like to spawn there. Critical turtle habitat, They almost every turtle utilizes some amount of wetland with maybe the only exception being a northern map turtle because they just like the edge of lakes, but they probably utilize wetlands to some extent as well. But Blanding's turtles are the quintessential kind of wetland species that utilize them. And then their nesting habitat for a number of different species of birds. And some species of birds are so specific in their habitat that it's a specific type of wetland that they use. And we'll talk about those in, in a little bit. The other importance of coastal wetlands are things like nutrient management, flood mitigation, and erosion prevention. And I'm going to kind of look at that nutrient management because there's a kind of big thing that people are talking about recently, which is algal blooms. And this is not necessarily like a hard and fast like study that's been done. It's there's some indication that algal blooms, you see less algal blooms if there are more upstream wetlands because what wetlands will do is they'll sequester toxic chemicals or sequester nutrients. And what that means is those don't enter our lakes. They don't enter Georgian Bay. They don't enter our larger lakes. And thus they don't create algal blooms. Again, it's there's some indication. I don't think there's been any specific studies completed yet on that. But it is one thing to note that it seems that algal blooms are more prominent in lakes that don't have upstream wetlands. Also important in flood mitigation, which is less important on Georgian Bay because our water levels are aren't necessarily always controlled the same way that other lakes might be but you know when we when we have that spring melt wetlands are what soak up that extra water and then erosion pre uh, prevention maybe not necessarily so important in georgian bay with the, all the rock we do have sand beaches that definitely would be impacted by that um, but it's also you know it it also stops wave movement in some cases so that also helps provide a buffer for docks and things like that that have emergent plants around them. So now that we've talked about the importance of them, what kind of types, what does a coastal wetland look like? What types do we have in Georgian Bay? And we have three, I would say we have two main types. We have marshes and fens are kind of predominant wetlands that we have in Georgian Bay. And swamps, we definitely have swamps, but they tend to be a more interior wetland. We don't see so many on the edge uh, the, on the coast and bogs as well. And we're going to talk about bogs a little bit later just to kind of clear up what the definition between a bog and a fen is. So cattail marshes, if we start in southern Georgian Bay, they're the they're pretty predominant in southern Georgian Bay. As soon as you get north of Honey Harbor, you start seeing fewer and fewer. Uh, and in fact, when you get all the way up to kind of San Susi, going up to Point of Barrel, they become quite rare ecosystems up there. Cattail marshes are our most productive wetland. They also are the one wetland that is that has a few very specific birds that tend to highly prefer that. And I would actually have called both these bird species cattail obligate species, meaning they require cattails 
until last year when I found them both in a sedge meadow. So the one pictured here is a marsh wren. Uh, you can see him with his tail pointed, well, right over his head. And they highly prefer cattail marshes, but they I have found them in sedge meadows in the past. Um, but on one of our properties in Port Severn, we protect a large cattail marsh there. And I've had at least 15 singing males in one day there. So large populations there and not in other places. Also a cattail obligate, quote unquote obligate, is the least bittern, which is a species at risk. Also highly prefers cattails because of it, it's a lot safer for them. It's harder for predators to see them. They can nest a lot easier. I have also found that species in the same sedge meadow that marsh wren were in. So again, almost cattail obligate, not necessarily fully, but uh, they you find them a lot more in these cattail marshes. Cattail marshes can look like a bit more of a monoculture than you might see in other wetlands with cattails being the really predominant one, whether that's narrow leaf or broadleaf, our two typha species. But you will also see things like common bladderwort in here, a number of other wetland plants kind of in between the cattails. You just have to get it a bit wet and dirty to find these species uh, and walk through the marsh, which is not always the easiest thing to do. I would I would say it's not always the most fun thing to do, but I really enjoy it. Not everyone does. <laughs> so yes, cattail marsh is uh, more of a southern Georgian Bay thing, but a really nice productive wetland type and characterized by those tall cattails, which we all know. Then we have emergent marshes, and these become more common as you go up the coast. Uh, out, probably north of Cognacine Honey Harbor, you're going to see a lot more of these than you see of many of the other wetlands. And you can actually see our other marsh type, which is our open water marsh right here. So you can see all those aquatic plants. And our emergent marshes are all these grassy bits right here. And emergent marshes are characterized by narrow leaf emergent plants like our grasses, our sedges, uh, our rushes or bulrushes. Uh, there's a number of different bulrush species, not cattails. Uh, cattails are typha. Many of our bulrushes are a different genus of species. So you, you tend to see them kind of, they root under the water and then grow out of it. That's why we call them emergent vegetation. And they're a really good habitat for nesting birds as well. They're much better for turtles than cattail marshes are. Cattail marshes are somewhat challenging for turtles to get around because cattails are much hardier plants. They're, you know, a nice stiff stem, harder to move around, whereas you can push a grass out of the way pretty easily. So these will be characterized by those grass sedges are kind of leafier plants. And then the last one I want to talk about, or last marsh I want to talk about, is our open water marshes. And these are our lily pad dominated marshes. So everyone thinks of the lily pads, uh, white water lily and yellow water lily being the two common ones. We see a lot of those, and those make these kind of easy to pick out. But an open water marsh doesn't necessarily need to have those. So I'm going to try to draw a few different species. We have, these are our water lilies right here. Looks like yellow water lily is a predominant one. That's the one with a nice yellow flower. We also have white water lily, which is a nice white flower. We also have water shield, water shield, which is our other lily species in Georgian Bay. That has a pink flower. And most people probably have seen it, but just haven't recognized it. Because it's small, it's maybe the size of a quarter. It doesn't stick very high up out of the water and it's not very showy like our white and yellow water lilies. But this a small pink lily that kind of pokes just up from the leaves. And I'll talk a little bit in um, a little bit later about exactly how to tell water shield from our other lily species. Right here, we have a grass leaved burr reed, these kind of like eel looking grasses just floating on the water. That's actually a burr reed. We have our American or likely American burr reed right here. We have things like pickerel weed over here, these uh, things just poking out up out of the water. I mean, potentially pickerel weed. It's hard to tell at this distance with this resolution, but 
that pickerel weed would be something that's pretty common in these kind of wetlands. And then you have a huge number of different pond weeds. So we have things like eel grass pond weed, floating leaf pond weed, uh, ribbon leaf pond weed, and the list goes on and on and on. And pond weeds are one thing, despite being called weeds, are quite interesting species. There's a lot of different ones, and they can be a bit difficult to ID, but they're also where we have a large number of our provincially significant species. So many of our aquatic plants are actually, there's very few populations of them in Ontario, usually about 100 or less populations. So there's a number, like snail seed pondweed is a really good one. We have naiads, which are submerged plants. They grow underneath the water. And there are also, there's several of them which are provincially significant. So open water marshes are great for finding some really rare species, but you have to do a little bit of digging and you have to kind of know what you're looking at. The other thing I should mention is a super good for both fish and turtles. You're going to see a lot of those in these kind of marshes. Less great for birds. We don't have as many birds that nest in here, but you will see things like Eastern Kingbird nesting in dead trees on the edge of uh, open water marshes. You might find things like pied-billed grebe or uh, redneck grebe in adjacent wetlands to an open water marsh because they like the open water marsh, but they have to nest on something more firm than a lily pad. So not as great for birds, but really, really good for turtles and fish. There's a lot of protection nothing can really see them from above because of all the aquatic vegetation. So great species are a great place to especially look for those types of species. And then we move on to fens. And I this, this photo is what I call a shrubby fen. And it could be a swamp. The reason I say it could be a swamp is because it it's a lot of woody vegetation. Swamps are predominantly woody, woody vegetation. You're going to see things like black ash in there. Uh, you're going to see speckled alder swamps, mountain holly swamps. This is leather leaf, this species that you see everywhere here. That is a woody stemmed plant, but it's more of a fen indicator. So I, I, I use this picture not necessarily because it's a uh, really good example of a shrubby fen, but it shows you what they can look like. They're low shrubs. They don't grow very tall. And fens can have about 50% more, 50 or more of low shrub cover. What you're going to see is if you dig in between these, and that is a lot less comfortable because there are lots of sticks in there and it's not easy walking. You're going to see a sphagnum moss on the ground cover, and then you're going to find a bunch of herbaceous plants kind of poking up through here. So things like Labrador tea is a good example. I believe we had sheep laurel here, things like bog cranberry you might find in these areas, uh, several different species of orchids. So fens are a really neat group of wetlands because there's lower species diversity that, than you might have in a marsh, but there's a lot of really interesting specific species that grow there. And each fen is going to be different. So when we look at the other type of fen being our graminoid herbaceous fen, this is where, these are my favorite types of wetlands. Maybe my favorite types of wetlands. I like them all. I love all wetlands equally. I might just love this one a little bit more. So the reason I love fen so much are things like this. This is tuberous grass pink, which is one of our native orchid species. We have over 30 different native orchid species. Many of them are found in fens. So they're a little bit more difficult to traverse because you can see the sphagnum mat underneath. And in our fens, a sphagnum mat is not necessarily a solid mat of moss. There are the places where if you step on it, you can feel the whole mat move with you. So there's a little bit of buoyancy there because often it's a floating mat on top of water. So sometimes a little bit more difficult to access, but a lot of really unique plants in there. We also have tawny cotton grasses are these white tufts and they're going to puff into more of a cotton ball a little bit later in the year. Then we have uh, our marsh slash Virginia chain fern. They look very, very similar. We have things like leather leaf, which is this, uh, all of these tiny, tiny shrubs in here. 
And then also on this fen, we had white fringed orchid, which is another species of orchid. You can have things like dragon's tongue orchid. You can have, uh, this is creeping snowberry right down here. So a, a good variety of species and really unique species. You're not going to find many of these species too many other places. The other neat thing about fens is often that's where our carnivorous plants live. So our sundews are very common fen species, our pitcher plants. So uh, there's some really neat interactions with the car carnivorous plants in our fens. And one interesting thing that they found in Algonquin and some of the fens in Algonquin is they actually had uh, pitcher plants, I believe, eating salamanders. So they would, salamanders would get trapped in there and also digested. So it's not just uh, flies and insects. Sometimes other things get in there as well. And we call them graminoid herbaceous because it's going to depend on what uh, is the dominant species. So graminoid are going to be our grass species, whereas herbaceous is our kind of more flat, more showy flowering plants. And then the last type of wetland that I want to talk about in our types of wetland is a Virginia chain fern bog. And you'll notice bog is in quotes. And this is because bog slash fen is a bit of a contentious debate sometimes. I follow the Ontario Wetland Eva Evaluation System because, like I said, that's how we designate our provincially significant wetlands. Fens look like bogs. In this last slide, this looks like a boggy thing. This looks, you know, that sphagnum moss on the underside looks very much like what you might see in a bog. They're very similar. The difference, there's a few differences though. So first of all is our plant species. Bogs have indicator species, fens have indicator species. There are certain species that are only seen in fens that aren't seen in bogs. There are certain species seen in bogs that aren't seen in fens. So if you have the list, which I do, and which is most likely available online if you really are interested, you can do some plant ID and say, okay, this is a fen because that's a fen species. The other thing you'll note is with bogs, they have peat hummocks. So the sphagnum moss will create more of a, almost a hill, like a small hill, like a, a hummock. And you won't see that in fen. Fens tend to be pretty flat in the way the sphagnum is laid out. And then the last thing, which is maybe one of the easier ways to ID them is Bogs have less than 14 plant species. Fens have more than 14 plant species. And you don't even need to be able to ID them. You need to just start counting different looking plants. And if you count 14, then you're into a fen. If you count less than 14, you're into a bog. So this is a Virginia chain fern bog dominated by that Virginia chain fern. But we saw these ferns here. It's way thicker than that. It's basically all you're walking through is fern with few plants kind of spotted through here. This one is actually a Virginia chain fern fen because we found white fringed orchid here and white fringed orchid is a fen species. It's only found in fens. So a bit of a tricky kind of distinction, but I would say the large majority, probably 95% of our bog slash fens in uh, at least Muskoka Perry Sound are going to be fens. They're not going to be bogs. Bogs are much more of a boreal thing. They, they're a lot further north. So those are our most common types of wetlands. Obviously, there are a few other ones, but you're going to see them much less regularly in Georgian Bay. So I originally, I wanted to talk about common coastal wetland species, but I started doing that and I didn't like it and decided I wanted to do notable coastal wetland species because I wanted to talk about some really distinctive species that when you see it in the bush, you might think, wow, that's that's a neat species. So I was going to do yellow or white water lily, but I feel like everyone kind of knows what that looks like or has a good sense of that because, I mean, white water lily and yellow water lily, you can kind of ide identify them basically based off their names. So I wanted to talk about water shield, which, as I alluded to earlier, is another lily, water lily species. And the way you tell uh, water shield from the other lilies is the shape of this leaf. So you'll see this is a very oval leaf and it doesn't have a like chunk cut out of it. White and yellow water lily have that little indent, the divot. Water shield is a wholly oval leaf. So this one is probably going to be more common than either white or yellow water lily. It's just going to get overlooked because you're going to see a bunch of floating water, water lilies and think, oh, it's whatever color I'm seeing. 
but actually this one sneaks in there very frequently and it's called water shield and it blooms in about June and it's got a very short blooming window with that little pink lily but if you're paddling definitely look for that if you if you're in an area where there's tons of water shield you're going to be able to pull that out fairly easy for a short bit of the year and once you see the flower you're going to start noticing it a lot more often because it's it is fairly distinctive it's just smaller and less showy than our other lilies our next species I want to talk about is wool grass. This is a common wetland species. You're going to see this kind of everywhere in a huge variety of different wetlands. You're also going to see the occasional wetland where this is the dominant species, where you're going to see way more of this than anything else. This is an early seed head for the species. These seed heads will puff out a bit more as the year progresses, and the seed head overall will droop a little bit kind of at the final stage. So it's going to puff out a bit more and then droop. And it's got a fairly long stem. They can grow probably about a meter, at least half a meter to a meter tall. So they're a decently sized plant. And the, that drooping stem in August is going to be super diagnostic. And you're probably going to see it everywhere this summer on Georgian Bay. Um, and it's called woolgrass or Scirpus cyperinus. Pardon my Latin pronunciation. I don't know Latin. <laughs> Next one is Canada mint. Neat thing, about, neat thing about mints is there's two ways to be able to identify whether it's a mint. One is ripping a leaf and crushing it and it'll smell like mint. The other is the stem is triangular or uh, rectang rectangular square. Uh, it's got four sides. And so if you just roll it in your hand, you'll be able to tell if it's a mint species pretty quickly. Canada mint, it blooms late. You see these whirls of purple flowers going up the stem quite a gorgeous sight when you get a large amount of it blooming in one area it turns the whole wetland kind of purple and honestly i don't know why we would make a mint flavor out of anything except for this plant it has the best mint sp smell out of any mint i've ever smelled in my life it's absolutely amazing and highly recommend finding this plant it, you can find it on the lakeshore right by your cottage and taking a sniff, crushing a leaf and smelling it because it's an absolutely astounding smell. My favorite mint. Maybe I shouldn't talk it up too much because you might just think it smells like a mint, but I, I think it smells really good. And then we have smooth saw sedge, which is not exactly a sedge. Our sedge sedges species look kind of like grasses. I could do a whole nother webinar on sedge species. They have a triangular stem, whereas smooth saw sedge is more of a rush species. It's going to have a circular stem. And the reason I bring this one up is it's not overly common outside of Georgian Bay. This is a real neat species in that it's quite Georgian Bay specific. There's a lot of it in Georgian Bay, but the further you move from Georgian Bay, the less you're going to see it, at least in the immediate vicinity. I haven't really botanize too much in Tobermory. Maybe it shows up on the Bruce, but it's really common in Georgian Bay. And if you move inland Muskoka, Perry Sound, it becomes less common. And it's got this really russet color. You can see the russet colored seed heads. And probably about August, middle of August, you're going to see this, this brownish russet color on huge patches of rushes, which is a pretty quick, easy way to be able to identify it. It looks somewhat similar to something like Canada rush, but the color is really diagnostic for the species. And then, oops, sorry, skipped one. This, and I skipped the better one. Um, this is white fringed orchid. This is really quite common in Georgian Bay, if you know where to look. This is a fen indicator species. So we see it on fens all the time. It blooms in about late July, mid to late July. Absolutely stunning. If you get a seed head, I, this is probably the most numerous flowers I've seen on a single plant, this photo that I took here, because I took it because of how many flowers there were. But there are often 20 to 30 flowers on a single stem. And you're going to see a number of them kind of dotting around the wetland. Absolutely gorgeous plant. Often when you find this, you'll find a different species of orchid there too. So things like rose pagonia, the tuberous grass pink we saw earlier, dragon's tongue orchid, lots of different orchids can be found with this one. And it's pretty diagnostic in that the white coloring 
there's not a lot of, a lot of other orchids that have this white coloration this uh pure of a white coloration and this is a little bit later so you can see some of the flower heads are actually starting to die back a little bit i unfortunately found it near the end of its growing season and you can ask, actually find these you can find them on coastal wetlands. You can find them on interior, interior wetlands. One of my favorite things to hunt for because often when you find this, you're gonna find something else equally cool. And then the last kind of notable species we have is three square bulrush. Uh, this group of bulrushes is the Schoenoplectus genus. There's a number of them. There's hard stem, there's soft stem, three square, and a few other ones. This one is really easy to identify. Three square is triangular stem. So you can kind of see between the photos, it's got a very obviously triangular stem, very small seed head, probably um, two thirds up the plant. But the triangular stem is really key to identifying this species because it's the only bulrush that I know of that has that triangular stem. And it's quite common in Georgian Bay. So hopefully if you if you remember one species or if you remember two species, hopefully you remember a species of orchid, first of all, because those are super cool. But this one is it's a bulrush that's probably growing pretty close to your dot dock. And if you just roll it in your hand, you'll be able to identify it right away. And that's three square bulrush. And then kind of to close out my talk, I wanted to talk about something a bit unique to Georgian Bay. So there's the Atlantic Coast Plain Flora, Atlantic Coastal Plain Flora. We have, I believe there's something like 60 some species in Georgian Bay or in this disjunct population, which includes Perry Sound, some of Muskoka and Georgian Bay. And it's called the Atlantic Coastal Plain because they're also found in Nova Scotia. And those are like the two populations. We have the populations in Georgian Bay and a little bit interior into Muskoka and then Nova Scotia and like nothing in between. And I don't think it's actually been exactly figured out how this happened. This movement happened at the end of the last ice age and they've been surviving ever since. So it's one super neat thing we have in Georgian Bay that if we lose this group of species in Georgian Bay, we've kind of lost them from everywhere except for Nova Scotia. So it's it's important for us to know about them and attempt to identify them or protect them where possible. So this one that's here is bog yellow-eyed grass, xerus deformis. Huge, di huge number of different wetlands it'll grow in. I often, most often see it in fens, but you will see it, like I saw it right next to someone's cottage like right close to one of their planted gardens. And I'm like, I don't know why this is here, but it is. And you should probably like keep this here because it's not found. It's this is the only place it's found from here until Nova Scotia. So uh, very neat species, pretty diagnostic with that seed head. So you see the kind of, I don't know, circular oval seed head there. And then there's just this, this yellow flower doesn't get much bigger than that. It's just like a couple of yellow petals, it looks like poking off the top. Um, I don't know if I've ever even seen it bloom much larger than that. So just a seed head with some very thin yellow flowers off the top is the easiest way to identify that one. Another one is lance leaf violet. And this one is a species that everyone probably has seen, but not too many people have seen blooming because it blooms at like the end of May, start of June. So if you're not in Georgian Bay early opening your cottage, you may never have seen this one bloom. If you don't come up to your cottage until end of June or July, all you're going to see is this lance-shaped leaf. So you see this really thin, long leaf here. That's, that's where it gets its name, lance leaf. It, it's shaped like a lance. And you can find this in wetlands. You can find this in like cracks and rocks, on sand beaches, number of different locations, again, like many of our Atlantic coastal plain species. Diagnostic leaf, you can identify that basically year round, but you're only going to see this nice white violet near the kind of end of May, uh, early June. And then the follow up to that is not an Atlantic coastal plain species, but if you've got to your cottage at like end of April, you might have seen early saxifrage blooming. And that's an absolutely gorgeous little white flower. Uh, 
but I've only ever seen that blooming once because we only got up that early to our cottage once. And it's, it's literally like the snow comes off Georgian Bay and it starts blooming. Another species is spoonleaf sundew. This is one of our carnivorous plants. And this one, you can kind of see it in the background. I'm sure everyone's seen their sundews. It's, it's this spoon or round shaped leaf with these little hairy bristles with like globules of, it looks like almost sap on the ends of them. And what happens is the insects will fly into that. It tracks the insects, they'll fly in, they'll get stuck and then digested by the sundew. So we have two different leaves or two different sundews. We have spoon leaved and round leaved sundew. This is spoon leaved because um, you can see this one's a little bit more oval. These leaves are a bit more oval here. Whereas spoon leaves are gonna be really, or round leaves are gonna be really, really round shaped leaves. There are also a hybrid between the two species, but I would just focus on the shape of the leaf to be able to identify them. So you're looking at oval versus round. Spoon leaf like, you know, a spoon, an oval spoon, round leaf like a circle. And then the neat thing about these is this flower that's growing up on all of these, it grows on a really tall stalk. And the reason for that is if you eat your pollinators, you don't pollinate. So this flower blooms on a stalk and what happens is the pollinators will come way above the leaves, pollinate the collect the pollen and move around and pollinate the flowers. And they don't actually get trapped by the sundew leaves, which are much lower to the ground. So it's a unique adaptation because eating your pollinators is a very bad way of getting pollinated. Oops. And the last one I want to talk about is Virginia Marsh St. John's wort. And I know you're probably super confused by all the species I've just dropped on you. And I just thought I would end with the most confusing one because why not? Uh, we have two Marsh St. John's wort. We have Virginia Marsh St. John's wort and uh, Fraser's Marsh St. John's wort. Basically, they all look like, they both look like this. This nice little pink flower that blooms around the end of July. They're often the plants, they'll turn like a, a dark red. The leaves will turn dark red as it ages going into August. And the way to tell the difference is to get out a ruler and measure the size of the petals. So. Uh, I would just call these, and I do call these most of the time, just Marsh St. John's wort because they're very hard to ID. You can also measure the style, which is this part of the flower right in here. And they have different length styles and they have different length petals, uh, but you can also just call them Marsh St. John's wort. And it's different than our other St. John's wort because it has a nice pink flower. Most of our other St. John's worts have nice yellow flowers. So they are actually in a different genus because of that. They're closely related, but this is the triadenum, whereas all our other St. John's worts are a hypericum, the yellow flowered ones. So that's kind of a brief overview of some notable species. Hopefully you'll have at least picked up a couple of those that you'll be able to uh, take and see this summer. And I would now open it up for any questions that people might have about coastal wetlands in general. And you can see our nice white water lilies in this photo, actually, all the floating white flowers. Thanks so much, Aaron. That was an excellent presentation. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat and I will read those out. Okay, we've got one here from Janet. Can humans do harm by walking through fens and bogs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and my answer to that would be watch where you step. I think the thing with fens and bogs is they're super understudied in Georgian Bay. <clears throat> we actually really have not a clue where our orchids bloom. We have this general idea that fens are great for orchids, but the actual distribution of where the orchids are showing up is just pretty much unknown. Like I can tell you where I found specific orchids, but I'm, I'm positive there's several other locations where you'd be able to find them. So the reason I say watch where you step is it is actually important for people to be photographing some of these species, because if we don't know where the species are, we can't protect them. And we don't actually have good senses of how common or how rare they might be. So getting into these fens and bogs is important. Just be careful and walk 
infrequently at them. So for example, the one that I showed you with the tuberous grass pink in there, I think we walked through maybe twice that year, once when the tuberous grass pink was blooming. And when we found the tuberous grass pink, we also found the white fringed orchid. It just hadn't bloomed yet. So it was still growing. So it would have been very easy to kind of crush it when you're walking through. So just walk carefully and don't walk frequently. That would be my response to that. All right. Uh, Jan's wondering about invasive species. Yeah. Um, marshes are especially susceptible to Phragmites. Um, Phragmites is those really, if you're driving up the 400 ever, you're going to have seen Phragmites. And it's that really tall, uh, it's technically a rush, I believe, Phrag Phragmites australis. And it's that really puffy seed head. And those are absolutely awful for marshes because what it does is it turns it into a monoculture. So if you thought that bulrushes created a mon or cattails created a monoculture, uh, Phragmites is like 10 times worse and it'll choke out things like cattails. And our native species haven't really adapted to using Phragmites yet. So basically it chokes out a bunch of native species that no longer can survive there. That would be the main one. Purple loosestrife is making a comeback this year or has been in the last couple of years. It's not as bad as Phragmites because it doesn't grow in quite the dense stands that Phragmites does. It's still not great to have, but Phragmites is by far the worst one. So if you see Phragmites reporting it to us or Georgian Bay Forever or a group that deals with Phragmites in your area is really important. All right, thanks. Um, Natalie's wondering, what do you call the little watery areas in the woods? I would think they were bogs, but they have moss that are underwater when wet. Yeah, those are called vernal pools. Uh, and those are really, really good frog spawning areas. Uh, if, you're, if you can ever get to a vernal pool in April, I can guarantee you'll be almost deaf um, after about five minutes, because that's where our wood frogs spawn, some of our spring peepers spawn in there. A um, number of different frog species use those. And they're called vernal pools because they're temporary bodies of water that dry up quite quickly in many cases. Um, so usually they'll be full in the spring and they'll just slowly decrease over summer. And then sometimes in fall, they'll fill up again. Um, but yeah, they're called vernal pools. Very, and salamanders are also hugely uh, reliant on vernal pools. So that's where you might find, um, interestingly, in April, if you go out, even sometimes when there's snow on the ground, you can see hundreds of salamanders walking across the snow to get to these vernal pools when like, they're just opening up. So really also a critical habitat that is pretty underappreciated overall. Okay. Um, Helen says, we have sandhill cranes most years lately and lots of Canada geese. How are they affecting the wetlands around us? Well, both of those are native species, and I would say sandhill cranes use fens predominantly or meadow marshes as a place to breed. I mean, I don't know if they're... Canada geese are a bit more difficult. So Canada geese are really only present. Most of our Canada geese used to migrate further north, but with the number of lawns going into the lake, and the destruction of shoreline vegetation, geese have come up and said, hey, we don't need to go all the way to the north when there's this perfectly good lawn to nest. And often they'll nest and be done nesting before you get up to your cottage. Like I've seen goslings on the water in early May. So they may be more of an issue. They're gonna predominantly be using, uh, they're predominantly gonna be breeding in wetlands quite early. So they probably don't affect a large number of wetland species. They might have some impact on the vegetation, but it's probably not much more than ducks would have. So, well, the number of geese we have breeding in Georgian Bay probably is not ideal. I, I don't think it has a huge impact on the ecosystem. There's just not enough of them yet. I think if everyone had, a, like if we turned all of Georgian Bay into like golf courses and lawns to the lake, then we might have an issue, but that would probably be more, would be less of an issue with Canada geese and just an issue of huge changes in our ecosystem. 
All right, thanks. Um, Patrick is asking about white and yellow water lilies. Um, says he used to have a lot in a bay near their cottage many years ago, but hasn't seen the flowers for a long time now. Just lots of leaves. May they have lost the flowering ones. Yeah, quite possibly. There could also be natural succession in your wetland. So uh, the wetland in front of our cottage, which is only maybe 2.2 acres, we have a small little wetland, coastal wetland in front of our cottage. And it used to be a sandbar for many, many years. And then it wasn't a sandbar and Sweet Gale moved in. And when Sweet Gale moved in, so did Blanding's turtles, interestingly enough. Um, and that came with a change in the water level. And then now that the water level has been decreasing, bulrushes like typha, which we're up in Go Home Lake, so bulrushes are, typha bulrushes are very odd that far north. And they moved in right at the height of our water level and they've slowly been growing into the wetland. So it also could just be a natural succession. The, uh, the thing that I didn't really get to or have enough time to talk about is we don't really understand how our coastal wetlands change in Georgian Bay. We don't know what a succession looks like. We don't necessarily know if water levels are just like there's a natural succession like bulrushes, sweet gale, pond weeds, and then it reverses and then it just keeps cycling through that or if there's constantly different species that are popping up. So I would say the thing to do would be to find these leaves, figure out if they're white and yellow water lilies, if it's a different water lily or a different plant that's moved in, and then everyone can you know, try to do a little bit more species inventory and see how that wetland in front of your cottage or near your cottage is changing. Because right now we don't really know that well how they succeed into, into one another. Erin, what resources would you recommend for someone who wants to learn to identify uh, more of the plants and wetlands around them? Yeah, iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist is a citizen science tool where you take a photo, it'll give you a recommendation and you can post it online. And then people like me will come and correct you <laughs> or, or the, or the identification might get it right. Um, or you might get it right, but that's the best tool to start because you can start that with zero plant identification skills whatsoever. You can take a photo of those lily leaves. You can post it on iNaturalist and someone will come and tell you what it is. And it will quite possibly be me if it's in Georgian Bay. <laughs> and then from that, you can build a species list and build your own identification skills, right? Like if you photograph this lily three or four different times and each time i'm saying it's white water lily you might start cluing into exactly like what shape uh is making it white water lily or things like that and you can also ask questions so if someone identifies it as x plant you can say hey how did you do that could you like talk me through your identification and oftentimes people will give you a couple quick tips on how they got to that identification all right awesome thanks um, Claudia is asking, what are your thoughts on cottagers planting gardens of flowers which are not Indigenous? I've got a lot of thoughts on that. Um, my, so I, I, you know, it's really nice to plant non-Indigenous plants sometimes. It's nice in that you get a, a different variety of plants. The nectar is still viable for many of like our butterflies. They can still feed on that nectar is kind of universal in a lot of ways. However, what you do when you plant non-Indigenous plants is you potentially remove host plants for a number of other species. So moths are a really key component of birds, bird diets, probably a number of bat diets. They're really key in that the, the caterpillars are used to feed the young and the large moths are used to feed bats and other birds. And what you do when you plant non-native species is you remove something like a lance leaf violet, which a few species of moths could use as a host plant to lay their eggs on and caterpillars could feed on to a plant that they're not gonna be able to use. So all you're doing is decreasing the overall biodiversity of your cottage area. And I highly recommend people to plant native when possible because there are many equally gorgeous plants that are native species that are going to have a much larger overall benefit than non-Indigenous plants. And the other thing I would add is there's like 1,500 different species of moths in Ontario, and some of them are super specific. 
For example, there's a couple different moss species that feed only on the submerged roots of alders, which is hyper specific. So if you remove that, that moth can no longer use that food source and then they have to move somewhere else. So I would, I would recommend people plant native species, but I do understand that there is a certain beauty to have some of the non-indigenous plants that are um, like very pretty looking. So it's a bit of a trade-off that you have to kind of figure out for yourself. All right, thanks, Aaron. Um, Janet says, we used to have lots of frogs in our back bay, which is an open water marsh, but hardly any now. Uh, do you know what's happening? Um, I haven't really seen huge changes in frog populations in Georgian Bay. Uh, I mean, I guess the one question would be what time are you coming up? Because often they'll be, uh, they'll be quite vocal up until June and then they quiet down a lot. So noise level is often the easiest way to be able to tell how your population is changing. So if you have this absolute like monstrous noise of spring peepers one year and the next year the wetland is silent, then that's an indication that it's changed. Um, there probably is an overall decrease, a slight decrease in frog species just because of things like pollutants ent entering water. They're more sensitive to things like t temperature changes and other species. But I don't, I don't know if I've noticed any like large scale trends. And I would say the easiest way to determine whether a population is changing is to be able to get there at some point when they're calling so you can hear if there's a change in the number of frogs that way, because it may just be a year that you're just not happening to see a lot of frogs for whatever reason, or they had a poor hatch or something like that. So I guess I, I can't give you a great answer to that question. Besides more monitoring is probably helpful. All right. I think that was our last question. Thank you again so much, Aaron. And thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm just going to hand it over to Janet now for some closing words. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Erin, that was um, super informative. I think all of us will go home with a really much better appreciation of what our wetlands look like and what they contain. Um, our summer events are uh, almost uh, complete, so check our website and we'll have all those listed. We intend to be in each of your communities this summer once, if not twice. And as always, we're very grateful for your support. And we do hope that you will continue to support the GBLT and please put us in your top three considerations for this year. Our next landmark speakers series is on April 20th with Laura Graham on night jar research. Then May 25th with Dr. Jacqueline Litkus on Ontario turtles. And then uh, late breaking June 21st with Doug Tozer and he's talking to us about loons. So please don't forget to register for all of these sessions. Thanks everyone for coming and have a wonderful evening.